Good morning, students. This is Mr. Bornheimer, and um, I'm going to be out today. I'm not feeling very well, but I'm going to go ahead and record the notes for today so that you have them, um, and then you can use them so that we can stay on track. So here we go. Um, today we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. Okay, we've talked about Newton's first law, so it's kind of a quick review. Um, remember that Newton's first law deals with this idea called inertia. And inertia is this idea that all objects want to resist a change in their motion. Not motion in general, but just a change in their motion. So an object at rest wants to stay at rest. An object uh, that is moving wants to stay moving. And so this idea of inertia or resistance to change um, is very important. And it comes into play more so um, we see inertia or inertial um, kind of resistance, especially with objects with large mass like the Earth and and um, other objects of mass. Newton's second law um, was more of a formula, but it was this relationship between acceleration, force, and mass. And we kind of diagram this in two ways. We've talked about it in several forms. Um, the first form was F, okay? So the force net, so all of the forces kind of put together, analyzing them, and is equal to an object's mass uh, times that object's acceleration. Now remember, acceleration means doesn't necessarily mean that the object's just moving, but it has to either be speeding up or slowing down. So an object that has mass that's speeding up must have a force being applied on it. And an object that is slowing down with mass must also have a force being applied on it. <clears throat> or a net force being applied on it. Okay, and we looked at several forms of this equation. We looked at acceleration um, when we just set it equal to acceleration, and we said, well, that's F net over m. We also looked at special forms of the equation where we looked at just the idea of weight where you take an object like you or I, a person's mass, and we multiply it by gravity or negative 9.81. And then there's this special one with elevators where we took the force of gravity, at, or excuse me, not gravity, we said the force of a scale reading, okay, so um, like if you were in an elevator, would be equal to an object's mass times gravity, and this is always positive in this particular situation, uh, plus an object's acceleration. So uh, in this case, the elevator's acceleration. And sometimes if the elevator was going down, that acceleration was negative, and if the, object, the ele elevator was going up, that acceleration was positive. We could see that affecting force or the weight or the apparent weight of a person in an elevator. So we've looked at all of these, and you should be working on your homework, and you should be applying these equations, and we'll be looking at them more in depth again. Okay, so first and second law, then we get to this idea of Newton's third law, and we see that kind of happen here. Okay, this is a diagram that is in your book, and it has some questions that you're going to be answering going along with it. But I really want to talk about what this diagram is, is looking at, okay? So when we first introduced the idea of a force, it was important that we stress the fact that a force is always an interaction between two or more objects. Uh, it is always an interaction, uh, and they come in interaction pairs. You cannot have a force if you have just one single object. You must have uh, this interaction. So we looked at this, and we said, hey, look, this is, must be, this must uh, apply to all things. And so Newton said, well, this, this can apply to even a large scale. I mean, everything must have interaction pairs. And so we see this idea of interaction pairs come into play in Newton's third law uh, here. Now, just off the bat, okay, we're going to look for here is an interaction pair, here is an interaction pair. And so you can, might want to note those in your notes, in your diagram. Okay, um, second of all, Okay, not only are these interaction pairs, but notice where, where the force vectors are, okay? Here in the center of the bowling ball is the earth on bowling ball. Notice the way that they say it. It's the force of the earth on the bowling ball. Now, the other pair, or the other force, is the force of the bowling ball on earth. Notice that they're forming these forces, they're naming them this convention, X on Y, and then the opposite or interaction pair is Y on X. Okay, so in the case of the one we were just looking at, it was the b Earth on bowling ball, Earth being X, bowling ball being Y, 
And then the interaction pair was the force of the bowling ball on Earth. Okay, Earth still X, bowling ball Y, but we've switched them. Okay. <clears throat> Now, one thing that, they're, that they always are looking at is they're looking for agents. And if you look back in your notes, um, I actually have your notes packet here so I can tell you what page. We introduced the idea of an agent or something that causes a force uh, right on page two, okay, um, and questions two and three. So this idea of an agent, okay, something that causes a force, well, this is always going to be the very first thing named. So in the case of the earth on bowling ball, in this case, the agent is the earth. But down here, the force of the bowling ball on earth, the bowling ball is the agent, and it's pulling on the earth. So we see this equal and opposite reaction, uh, and this is what we call an interaction pair. Now, to kind of give you an example of some of the applications of this concept, let's look at a hammer. Um, and you have um, some space at the bottom of page 14, um, you might want to use that space now just to diagram this, this idea here. So let's say for a moment that you have a hammer. Okay, and we're going to draw the hammer like so. And that hammer is going to strike a nail into a wall like so. And I hope that none of the walls in your home look quite this squiggly. That would be rather unfortunate. Um, though, if you like it, cool. So you have the hammer, you have the nail. First of all, I'm going to do a comparison of mass. Okay. So let's say the mass of the hammer is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 kilograms. Now, you can probably imagine that the nail is much less massive. Okay. So we'll say that the mass of the nail is something like, and we could probably come up with something like 100, maybe 50 grams. So this would be, you know, 0 0.050 kilograms. Okay? Now, when that hammer strikes the nail, okay, anytime there is a force applied, Okay, and this would be considered a contact force. Okay, so we're looking at some kind of contact um, or striking force. Okay, then there's going to be two two forces. There's going to be uh, there's going to be an interaction pair that takes place. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is this interaction pair? So we look at the hammer. Okay, and we say, what is going on with the hammer? Well, when the hammer strikes the nail, okay, so the red dot represents the nail, the blue dot represents the hammer. Remember, when we make dots like this, this is your free body diagrams. When the hammer strikes the nail, it exerts a force in this direction on the nail. We would say that this is the force of the hammer on the the nail. Okay, so that's what that one would be. Okay, but now there's an equal and opposite force that must act on the hammer. So we would say that there is a force, okay, and this time we're going to say the nail, so notice that the, this vector is red. It's equal and opposite, okay, to this one, but we're going to name it differently. This will be the force of the nail on the hammer. Again, notice how I'm naming these. Hammer on nail, the blue, or the hammer on the nail. And then the nail on the hammer, the nail exerting an equal and opposite force on the hammer, okay, such that it's in the opposite direction. Okay, so we see that these two forces are acting in equal and opposite directions. Okay, now sometimes when we look at this, we're like, well, then how does a nail get pushed into a wall? Okay, if they're equal and opposite forces, wouldn't they cancel out? Wouldn't that mean that there is technically no force that's acting in one direction or the other because they're all canceling out? And the answer is no. This is a very common misconception in physics. They are not necessarily canceling one another out. They're just acting in opposite directions on different items. That's the key. Okay, to give you a difference of example, 
if I'm standing on the ground, so this is Mr. Bornheimer. All right, get it, Mr. Bornheimer, blue, B, great letter, okay? And I'm standing on the ground, okay? Okay, so here's the ground. Well, if you look at just me, not anything else, you would see that the force of gravity is pulling down on me, and the ground is pushing back up on me, and we'll just do this one as red, because it matches the ground. Okay, and the force of the ground on me. I better put a little R here, just so you know it's the ground. Well, if you're looking at just me, I'm not going anywhere, because all the forces acting on me are canceling out. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these are interaction pairs. Interaction pairs don't act on the same object. They act on different objects. So the question is, what are the interaction pairs here? Well, in order to figure out the interaction pairs, you have to figure out what am I interacting with. In this particular case, I am interacting with the earth and the ground. So, the, so we have two things going on here, okay? The force of the ground on me, well then there must also be a force that's acting on the ground, so it's red. Blue arrow, meaning I'm acting on the ground. This is the force of me acting on the ground. This is a contact force, okay, because it has to deal with touching, all right? I'm touching the ground. It's a contact force. Now, the f force of gravity, that's different because that's a field force. So that is going to be a different interaction pair, and that's dealing with the earth. So if we have the earth, boom, over here, and there's lots of water on the earth, okay, and, brrr, and there's some land and some more water. Okay, this is the Earth. I know it's an awesome sketch. Okay, if this is the Earth, then I'm acting on the Earth. If the Earth is pulling down on me, I'm pulling up on the Earth. So if this is the Earth's arrow, okay, I'm going to be pulling up on the Earth. So this is the force of me on the Earth. This was the force of the Earth on me, force of gravity. Okay, this is the force of me and the Earth. So we see interaction pairs. There's an interaction pair here. Okay, notice they're equal and opposite. And there's another interaction pair here. Okay, the force of the ground on me, the force of me and the ground. Okay, interaction pairs have to go together, okay? So if it's a field force, then the field, they both must be field forces. If it's a contact force, then the interaction pair must incorporate two contact forces. And they are always equal and opposite. Okay, so this is that example of field forces. So to get back to our nail and our hammer idea, okay, we see these interaction, this interaction pair going on here, okay, between the hammer and the nail. Now, where Newton's law comes into application is, we start to look at, okay, if the forces are equal and opposite, then how can there be movement? And the answer deals with, really, the definition of Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, and the reason it deals with Newton's second law is because if we have differing masses and the forces are the same, that's going to mean that the accelerations are different. All right, so we have to look at, you know, how does that play into effect here? So let's take a look at the hammer. Let's say that the force that the hammer exerts is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 newtons. Okay, so it's going to be, and let's say that this direction to the right is positive. So it's going to exert a force of 50 newtons, and its mass is 1.5 kilograms. And the question is, what is its acceleration? Okay, well... At this point, why don't you all take out your calculators, calculating devices, okay? I'm just giving you a moment to take out your calculator. You should be taking out your calculator, if it's not already out. All right, awkward moment over. So we have our calculators, and we're going to take 50, and we're going to divide it by 1.5, and we get 33, which means that that the hammer is going to be accelerating at about 33 meters per second squared. Okay, great. 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna just kind of tuck that number right in here inside the hammerhead. And I'm gonna erase this. And now I'm gonna analyze the same kind of thing happening with the nail. Okay, so I'm gonna say, okay, the force. Um, all right, so the, the, the force acting on the hammer was 50 newtons, and I should probably, okay, and that means that the hammer was moving at about 33 meters per second squared. Um, this would be a very, very fast, by the way. This is all hypothetical. Uh, but notice that the force acting on the hammer is to the left, which means that the acceleration should, was to the left. So if this direction is positive, oh, I didn't want to do that. If this, if to the left is positive, then this should be negative, okay? Because this force is acting to the left, the acceleration acting on the hammer is going to be to the left. Now let's look at the nail. The force acting on the nail, okay, on the nail, so over here we see on the nail, is also 50 newtons. They're equal and opposite, okay? I can't stress that enough, equal and opposite. Okay, so if they're equal and opposite, that means that the force acting on the nail is in the positive direction. It's going to be also be 50 newtons. Okay, not negative 50 like the hammer. The mass of the nail, however, is much much smaller than the hammer. So the question is, what is the acceleration of the nail? So you take 50, calculating device, you divide it by 0.05 you get 1,000 meters per second squared, of course. So that means that the nail is moving at an acceleration to the right in the positive direction of 1,000 meters per second squared. That is much larger than negative 33 meters per second squared. 33 meters per second squared to the left is a much smaller acceleration than 1,000 meters per second to the right. Now, the hammer wouldn't strike with this kind of force, okay? That would be a, kind of immense, okay? But it's just to give us an example. It was meant to show us that even though the forces are equal and opposite, the accelerations can be different. This is why when you strike a nail with a hammer, bam, okay? When you strike that nail, the nail goes into the wall, and the hammer doesn't bounce back very much. The heavier the hammer, the less bounce it will have. If I increase the mass of the hammer, I will decrease its acceleration. The idea is that you want a hammer that can hit a nail that doesn't then bounce back. Okay, because every if that was the case, every time you hit something, it'd bounce back and hit you in the head. Okay, and that would mean that a lot of contractors would end up very hurt, and that's not good. Okay, and we wouldn't be able to build many things. So this idea of equal and opposite forces. So I want you to try your hand at it. Okay, one last thing. Okay, before we're done here, and that is going to be that you have some things coming up. First of all. Um, there are a couple of common uh, equal and opposite reactions. One is called the normal force, okay? So the force uh, normal. I wanna define this formally for you. A normal force is always a force that deals with contact forces. And it always is a force that counteracts an applied force perpendicular, excuse me, perpendicular to a surface, okay? This is key. So in this diagram, the force of the ground on me was in reaction to the fact that I was touching the ground. Notice that it is perpendicular to the ground. If this is the ground, the force of the ground on me is perpendicular. We call this, this is a very special type of force, we call this the normal force and it acts perpendicular to the ground. So here's what I want you to do, okay? You have in your packet the diagram uh, that we were looking at, okay? This diagram a couple of pages back, this one. Okay, and you see there's different interaction pairs. They're worded a little differently. Um, so make, just 
use this diagram to answer all of the questions on page 14. And then on the following page, I want you to go ahead and answer all of the questions for the diagram in section D1. Okay, dealing with normal force and tensional forces. Now, we haven't talked about tensional forces too much, but I want you to go ahead and try your hand at the normal force portion, so page 16. If you complete these two assignments, okay, pages 14 and pages 16, and I will be coming around tomorrow and looking to see how much you got accomplished, uh, then you may work on your homework. You have two homework problems, number 17 and 18 tonight, okay? The very last thing, um, and this is just uh, a quick reminder, you'll be getting a handout uh, dealing with your Newton racer. Um, we're going to talk more about this tomorrow, but you're going to, it's basically a car that you have to build. And uh, just read through the handout, um, make sure that you're familiar with it. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email or let me know. Otherwise, uh, have a great day, and I'll be seeing you hopefully tomorrow. All right, talk to you later, and have a great day.